My name is Kelly Wilkins and I serve as the Minister of Social Justice and Reentry at Covenant Baptist United Church of Christ in Washington, D.C. And I'm Carlton Elliott Smith, one of the ministers at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, Virginia. Please join us now in conversation. And here in Arlington, I was very excited to come here because I had responsibility for three areas primarily. Those were membership, the social justice program, and our denominational connections. And when I came here, one of the things that really was really great for me was knowing that I would have an opportunity to work across those platforms because our denomination chose to have a focus on immigration as a moral issue. So these past three year, years, we've been doing a tremendous amount of work getting educated about immigration and looking at the parallels between that and other justice movements. Uh, so I've been focusing on social justice quite a bit. And in more recent months, my attention has turned away from denominational connections and membership more in the direction of pastoral care and our small group ministry program. So all of those are things that I've been paying attention to for these past several months. What about you? Wow. So <laughs> I have several responsibilities. Um, um, I serve as the Minister of Social Justice and Reentry. And so one of my major pieces is working with men and women coming home from prison. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I run our, we have a, a nonprofit, our church's nonprofit has a faith based initiative. And um, so I recruit faith, other faith institutions as well as concerned citizens in the community to um, mentor, um, to provide services. Um, we have maybe about 40 something, about 42 institutions that actually mentor or provide some kind of service um, mm -hmm. to men and women coming home. And we also um, pu um, partner with a public agency, a federal agency called CSOSA. Um, well, that's the acronym. The entire name is Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency. And they're an independent federal agency and their job really is to provide supervision, parole, or probation for people coming home. So we're able to sort of um, create a triangle of where mentors are able to converse with the pro officers, or they call them community supervision officers, mm -hmm. and um, as well as the actual client, and we develop a mentoring plan for them. Um, so when they come home, we can, you know, if you need support in terms of family support or housing or looking at um, other moral support that you might need um, returning home, because it's a big need. You know, a lot of folks, they need a lot of needs when they return home. So um, um, it's, it's, it's a very supportive program and it really helps people to reintegrate back into the community. It helps them with jobs, you know, explore in terms of looking for jobs. And that leads me to the other piece is that I've been working on two job campaigns. <laughs> one locally um, here in the district and then the other one is nationally, which just, we just began partnering with an organization called the Senyu DeWitt Proctor Conference. And, um, and that's a national called um, Good Jobs Nation. But the local one, um, we actually are a member of an organization called Washington Interfaith Network. And, um, and I can give you all the information about that, but that, that piece is that um, there are a number of issues that we're working on with, the, with WIN, but that piece, um, it looks at green jobs. And um, particularly, um, DC Water <laughs> is actually um, undergoing a major project and we are trying to demand some jobs in that area. So yeah, oh wow. It, in some other areas as well, in the congregation, um, there are always some um, areas in which social justice has to be looked at. We, looked at, we look at marriage equality, as well as um, working with, um, uh, right now, you realize that the uh, Supreme Court is taking up the issue of the um, Voter Rights Amendment. Section 5 is being challenged by Selby, Alabama. And so we're trying to develop some actions to make sure we understand that we, our voting rights need to be protected. So there are many different areas that we um, look at as a social justice ministry and, and within the congregation as well. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm, I'm listening to you talk and I'm just thinking we're overlapping on so many different <laughs> levels. as. 
as uh, religious movements, I'd say we're like first cousins. You know, you're being <laughs> congregational and my coming from the Unitarian Universal side of the equation. I was listening as you were t listening as you were talking about uh, the work that you're doing with regards to people coming back from having been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard of this book, uh, The New Jim Crow? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I recently, uh, with some folks in the congregation, we did a radio blog through the internet. Uh, based on that that we did over the course of eight episodes where we were looking at the different aspects of mass incarceration and what mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness as Michelle Alexander describes mm -hmm. it. And um, just seeing some, so many parallels looking at what's going on with that and what's happening with um, with detention for immigrants into the United oh, yeah. States. Um, that's something that I've been paying a lot of attention to. I remember when I was a, a very young person growing up in Mississippi, there came a time that there was a prison, a private prison that was built in my hometown um, in a kind of like an economically depressed area. And now we see that same thing going on with detention centers sponsored or, or uh, organized and, and created by the same folks who put up those prisons for African Americans, are now doing it for Latino and Latino, Latino and Latina people. And um, it's just amazing to see how those, those parallels play out. Um, so many, it seems like to me that America's always had a foundation of people who were undervalued. Uh, if we go all the way back to indentured servitude and slavery times, and we just keep fast forwarding up to this present uh, day and age where we see that happening, that continuing to happen, if we're looking at people who, put, who make it possible for us to have food on our tables, the people who make it possible for us to have clothes on our backs, we're implicated in some ways in these factory disasters that have happened in South Asia. So all of these things are, are things that we engage with. Now how, how with all of these possible things that are going on do you manage to figure out like, okay, we're gonna focus on this issue and not that issue, because you could do so many things. I know it's always a challenge for me. It is a <clears throat> challenge. I think um, I think one of the major pieces is um, you always, even though you, um, you, you try to follow the wishes of what the congregation, you know, wants, you also look at what makes your heart sing, mm -hmm. what things um, touch your heart and um, those things you're able to, based on your calling, educate your congregation about, you know, these are important. But Usually, those things connect with our congregation, resonate with our congregation anyway, because we have a very strong social justice core. Before I got there, they had a social justice ministry, you know. So it's something that they already are very keen or have a keen ear to. And so, um, um, in terms of prioritizing it, that's a little more difficult <laughs> because um, all of them are equally important. Um, we've gotten we've gotten calls from. Um, persons from New York and different places on the issue of immigration. And, um, and their um, perspective is that people of color are being um, detained at higher rates. Um, um, people of color, particularly from the Caribbean, um, are being deported at higher rates. And they called us, you know, wanting us to get involved in the plight that, you know, uh, their plight. And the congregation we definitely was like, yeah, you know, but, you know, we still are still trying to figure out how do we organize around that specific issue. And we need those persons that are calling on us to organize with us because, you know, th they understand the issue better than we do, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, um, all, of, all of those things, um, voter rights, it's always been something important to our congregation, so it makes it much easier to say we're going to um, do prayer vigils at the Supreme Court every weekend. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's much easier to, to do that. Um, marriage equality has been something our, our pastors have been leading the forefront on in the district and was very instrumental in the, um, the bill getting introduced in the district in, in terms of um, 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 the council people signing on to it. So it was very easy for our congregation to say, hey, you know, we've been doing this for years. And now is the time, you know, that this needs to be done. And um, the issue of mass incarceration, I would say that that has always been a, something that has been a concern for me growing up and even um, um, as a young adult seeing people that I knew incarcerated and just seeing the, how the, the systemic issues around incarceration and the issue of them coming home and having no opportunities and being disenfranchised, particularly in Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. I look at the, the conservative laws that they have in Virginia and the disenfranchisement of the vote in, a, yeah. in a Virginia. And so how do I figure out which one? 
you know what, you just can't do them all. <laughs> and when I, if you talk about incarceration, if you're helping people returning home, you can't miss the issue of jobs and housing. So they have to connect in some kind of way. And, and that's why with when we're able to work with housing and we're able to work around issues of jobs locally. And I do most, of, most things locally, um, but this national piece on, on, um, on a good jobs nation, um, it was just an opportunity that I think we need to step on, uh, up, step into as a congregation. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't know that the government is the largest em uh, employer of low wage workers. And, and, it, and it, this is done really through, um, you know, they give money, our tax dollars is given to contractors, to small business administration, all these funds are going to contractors or other people who are receiving the money. And of course, the CEOs are getting these exorbitant salaries, but they're paying workers less than what they can, um, live, you know, have to support themselves every day. So the U.S. government pays um, low wage wa um, wages more than Walmart and McDonald's combined. Mm. So that's, you know, that's an issue, a moral issue, that we taxpayers are fueling this. And, and, you know, we have people making uniforms for military and can't pay rent, you know, and they have to come to the government for food stamps. Well, if we pay them, then we, they don't have to come to support, you know, and they can pay taxes, you know, more taxes. And so this, these are the kind of issues that, that we run into. The returning citizens, they can't find a job, you know what I mean? Right. Or if they get a job, it's usually something that they can't support themselves. So those are the kind of issues that really touch us um, in, in our congregation. And our church is in a ward where um, it's the highest unemployment rate in the district. You know, we, they say 22%, but we know it's more than that. And so yeah. those are the kind of issues that we look at. Yeah, and, and what have you found to be the uh, relative advantage to being in cooperation with other faith-based organizations, with other congregations? Like you had mentioned WIN before, and the congregation I belong to, uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church here in Arlington, is also part of an Industrial Areas Foundation mm -hmm. affiliate. Yeah, it's called VOICE. Uh, yeah, Virginia's organized for interfaith community engagement. And so much of the work that we've been doing has been around affordable housing, mm -hmm. around looking at how uh, people of color communities and immigrant communities have been so adversely affected by the mortgage crisis from a few years back and trying to provide some sort of support and restitution for them. How have you found that to be in Washington in terms of like working together regardless of the different faith uh, groups that you represent there in Washington? It's been awesome. Uh, I, you know, I think that's the, the beauty of, um, of WIN is that, you know, we have about maybe about 40 faith institutions and organizations and unions that are part of it. And um, it's diverse, you know, we have um, rabbis and, you know, what well, we have um, synagogues and we have mosques and we have Christian um, churches that are a part of it. And so um, um, when we come together, it's a united front. You know, these are the issues that we believe are morally important. And that's, that to me, to find so many people on the same page is so hard, <laughs> mm. especially in, 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 you know, in the religious realm, you would think we would be on the same page, but <laughs> sometimes yeah. it's uh, lots of Lots <laughs> of issues. You have to choose the issue very carefully, yeah. right? And yeah. I know that certainly within Voice, uh, the core team that does the organizing spends a lot of time just figuring out, okay, what is it that we can actually stand together and have and, and be a united front upon with regards to some of the issues that concern us, and it's it evolved around immigration and Mm -hmm. affordable housing and health care issues, um, access to public transportation, that sort of thing. Good. Yeah. Well, this year we've had a very good year so far in terms of organizing. And um, um, last year, uh, May of last year, we kicked off a green jobs campaign. And um, basically, um, the first thing we were looking at, how do we employ, for me, how do I get returning citizens employed? How do I get people east of the river employed because of the high unemployment rate? And when I say 22 and a half percent, I'm not even including Ward 7. I'm mm -hmm. just looking at our little ward and, you know, um, and so, and going to employers begging for jobs, that just is not working <laughs> for me. So I'm thinking, how do we 
um, begin to look at it differently. And so, of course, our organizer always, you know, asks those kind of questions to the ministers. And with research, we found out that we look for labor intensive kinds of opportunities. And we found that DC Water, WASA, was um, uh, undergoing a major clean rivers project. And they were going to be building three huge tunnels to deal with stormwater pollution. Um, they were sued by the EPA in 19, um, I don't know what year, 2005. Yeah, 2005. And so um, that piece um, resonated with us because tunnels really don't produce jobs. You know, they're very labor intensive. Um, highly skilled workers work on these tunnels, but there were alternatives that um, that could be done. Um, and actually, um, storm water pollution is an issue all over the country in urban areas, you know. And so, um, the idea that they can do low impact development like rain gardens, green roofs, um, you know, those sidewalks where the water actually you know, was able to, you know, absorb through. And th those kind of projects uh, will green our city and mm -hmm. also employ thousands of people. And they have to be maintained over a long, you know, periods of time. So for us, that was a winner. Labor intensive, living wage jobs, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we started educating churches about it. Um, I was on the I was going to Bible studies. I was just going all over the city, you know, telling uh, people in the community about this opportunity, and people loved it. And and so um, we started trying to meet with DC Water. Um, the general manager is George Hawkins, and at first the meetings went well, <laughs> but after a while, when we start asking for jobs, that really didn't work go over well. Um, and, and what we're asking them is to pay, make sure their contractors um, hire DC residents, um, a certain amount of DC residents, and pay them living wages. And um, what happened was we stopped hearing from George Hawkins after a while. And, um, and so what we, um, we really had to step up the tension on how we were going to organize to make sure that this opportunity didn't get missed. And um, in terms of demanding, not only that they change the dissent decree to something that um, looked more labor intensive and was more uh, in terms of greener in terms of our city, but also making sure when that happens that DC workers got the job. Right now, DC Water has a 10% hiring rate on major projects. And that is not acceptable. <laughs> mm. That's not acceptable. And then on top of that, DC residents' rates are going up. So in order for us to pay for this major $3 billion project, our rates have to go up. And so if you're paying $15, $20 a month now, you're going to be paying $120 some dollars by 2018. So for us, the thing is, we will not allow, <clears throat> well, the bottom line is, we, we will take the investment in, in our um, infrastructure, but we are demanding investment in our people as well. And, 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 and we believe that that's a moral issue. And so we want them to hire at least 30 to 40, 35% DC residents, and then increase that over time. And so we created a, um, um, when we created a community benefits agreement, um, we had a 700 person action um, in April on Earth Day, <laughs> and um, and six council people showed up. They agreed to um, support the community benefit ag agreement. One of them actually sponsored it, and um, the other six are going to co-sponsor, and we're looking for them to introduce it sometime by June. Mm. Um, well, as, as I think about it, there's just, um, Lots of things that uh, engage us and that we want to participate when it comes to our social justice work. And I look to the model of people who have gone before us, like Dr. King and mm -hmm. his approach. And sometimes when I'm when we're working on social justice projects, I wonder about like how we maintain that same momentum, have that sense of spiritual sustenance 
that -hmm. keeps us going forward because sometimes, you know, especially I say on the liberal end of the spectrum, it can become about being angry and upset and very aggressive with people as we are trying to, you know, work for a change. But I think somehow that uh, spirit of generosity, that spirit of love for people that you disagree with has to be present uh, in order for us to continue to bear witness to the, to the real depth of our faith. And I'm wondering if you find that to be um, something that you're, that you have to, a question you have to engage with when you're doing the work that you're doing as we're speaking truth to power in these different realms that we engage with. I grew up in a family that, you know, justice was important. And there was really no difference between your faith and justice. You know, there was always this intermingling of the two. And, you know, that's, you know, so they're so connected to me. I, I feel it's natural, it's, it's natural. But you, you can get that tension, that anger, when you see that people don't get why we need to help homeless homelessness, you know, yeah. why Why we need to put money towards it. You're trying to figure out exactly <laughs> why you don't get this. Um, um, or people say, um, I was reading the comments from an article in the Washington Post about our um, project, and people were saying things like, um, um, you know, they must want to help I mean, they, they, they're just trying to get those black people jobs in, in Southeast, you know, lazy black people, South, mm -hmm. you know, who are probably ex-offenders. I'm thinking, like, where do people get this, you know, their minds? And, and all you can do is really stay centered and pray. But for you, you're in Virginia, and, um, I mean, I know that you see a lot of, um, um, you get a lot of, um, pushback and particularly around the is issue of immigration and housing how do you how do you deal with that um, I tr try to be we try to be strategic about it uh, try to pay attention and to acknowledge um, allies who are working on the same issue and provide them the affirmation and support that they need uh, we were recently in Senator Warner's uh, office uh, a voice delegation was there with him in conversation and um, he was saying that one of the things that would be helpful to him is to get, you know, some sort of balance to all of the kind of, um, I would say, hater kind of uh, email and messages that he gets around immigration issues and start to get a bit more uh, people who are affirming and supportive of his stance, which has been in favor and support of immigration. So um, it's an ongoing challenge and, you know, and a lot of people think of Northern Virginia as this uh, separate state from the rest of... Yeah from the rest of Virginia. Um, and it's, it's true, I mean, as you go deeper and further south in the state, you can start to look around and see what's on the billboards and such, and it's, it's a different kind of um, world the deeper you go <clears throat> into the state of Virginia. But I think uh, for us, it's really about being consistent. I draw so much inspiration from the people that I see uh, doing such tremendous work. Um, one of the things that we've had a chance to do over these, this time that we've had this focus on immigration is to be in conversation with the dreamers, the young people who would benefit from the passage of the DREAM Act. And um, just having a chance to get to know and engage with those uh, young people and to understand you know, their struggle to get an education, to be able to stay in this country and to make a difference and contribute and support their families, it's really very inspiring. Um, in itself, and so I, I look to them, you know, for, for inspiration and guidance. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I, I have to say is that, you know, my hope is, and I've, I've said this to, to the dreamers that I know, is that as we go about seeking to have this transformation happen, that, that they, as they're coming into this country, are able to see themselves as part of an ongoing uh, justice, struggle for justice in the United States. Um, traditionally, I would say that the, the route to success and to the quote-unquote American dream that we've inherited over the years has been over the backs of uh, disadvantaged people in this country. And that's usually been African Americans, as it's turned out. You know, so people uh, en route to advancement in this country have you know, joined in, uh, in condescension of African American people. But in the 21st century, I like to think that we have the possibility of making uh, different choices and providing young people with different models and paradigms so that they're able to see how, how African American tradition and, and the civil rights struggle connects to the immigration struggle today, not solely for the benefit of, of immigrants, but really to become partners and allies 
uh, in those struggles as well. And I think that's the only way that uh, we can actually <clears throat> see a transformation of the society because otherwise I feel like we run the risk of just repeating what we've seen before, which is a paradigm of, of dominance and um, leveraging one's uh, own power um, and, and one's relative advantage uh, while putting other people down. One of the ongoing challenges I'd say we have around the, uh, the immigration issue is how do we broaden it so that, we, that although we, we acknowledge and recognize the numerical strength of people coming from Spanish-speaking countries, that we don't exclude people who don't necessarily come from those countries. Mm -hmm. And there are many of those folks as well, but when you go to a rally sometimes and, you, and, the, and the, sometimes the predominant language might be Spanish, it's like if you're coming from um, Eastern Europe, or if you're coming from uh, some, a country in Africa, it's like how do you <laughs> engage in this in this struggle in this in this um, in this uh, and day see and time? Yourself, right? Yeah, and see yourself, and even mm -hmm. understand like what the conversation is. If you not only have to grasp hold and become proficient in English, but also become proficient in Spanish, you know. Wow. So that, that's that's so it's it's very complex issue, very mm -hmm. complex. So the Dreamers are those. Um, those who benefit from the Maryland Dreamers Act, or is that is that nationwide or just? Well, what? nationwide, there are people who identify as Dreamers, and okay. some, in some states, they've been more like Maryland. They've been much more successful in terms of advocating for their for their rights and getting and getting access to um, education at in-state tuition rates, for example. So uh, there's Dreamers organized in, in all of the states, I would say, pretty much. Um, and, um, but, but yet they're united in their struggle, and some states are further ahead than others in that regard. So how did you um, get involved in justice? You know, how did you start connecting justice in your faith? W where did that come from? Yeah. Um, it goes back very far. Uh, when I think about it, I think about uh, having grown up in the South, uh, it was uh, the same thing for me as well. I mean, it's just something that we, that we just lived and breathed, you know, all the time. So I've got, so, so I always had some consciousness around that. My parents met at an African-American mission school, a Methodist school, mm -hmm. uh, back in the 50s, and that school was started after the Civil War. So um, I think there's a long tradition and heritage uh, in that regard as well. Yeah. Um my parents, my father was a union steward. <laughs> and so his job was always trying to keep folks their jobs, and particularly African Americans, because they came in under the affirmative action piece. Mm -hmm. And they were the last in, but they were the, always the first to get fired. And so he was always working on that. And I still remember my mother taking me with her, with her little clipboard, registering people to vote. Um, so when we elected our first black mayor, I, w I couldn't vote then, but our first black mayor of Chicago, which was Harold Washington, mm -hmm. and, um, and all of that, you know, sort of seeped into our faith, <laughs> too. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, and was informing that as well. And I can remember when that happened, it was a major uh, national uh, cause for celebration. Yeah, I was excited like I voted or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a, a great thing, yeah. Even as a kid. Yeah. Well, we have so much that we owe to the legacy of those who have gone on before, and we're the ones who have the benefit and the advantage of being able to go forward today in this uh, struggle for justice. And I'm just really very, very grateful for this opportunity to get to know you a bit and um, hopefully have a chance to work together and collaborate further down the line. Yes, most definitely, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.